Okay, so David Milstein is uh, internationally recognized as a world leading chemist, highly successful at developing new concepts and achieving catalytic transformation of considerable academic and industrial relevance. As you know, chemistry is both a science and an industry whose annual turnover is, approximately, is more than $3,000 billion. As you also know, catalysis is a major field of chemistry aiming at producing transformation, facilitating molecular transformations and providing selectively added value chemicals with lower energy consumption and reduced, ideally zero waste. Its relevance to modern economy and needs for sustainable economy is therefore obvious. David Milstein's pioneering work has led to groundbreaking discoveries and have provided constant inspiration to other chemists and have led to major development in chemistry. Already as a postdoctoral fellow, he made a major discovery since with his advisor, he discovered the so-called Stille reaction that is widely used worldwide for CC coupling reaction. And you know, this is a key transformation in organic chemistry to generate carbon-carbon bonds. He then went to industry from 1979 to 1986 at DuPont in the US. And I think that's where I met you for the first time. And he became a group leader in the Central Research and Development Lab in Wilmington. In 87, he moved to the Weizmann Institute, where he now holds the Israel Math Professorial Chair of Organic Chemistry and is founder and head of the Kimmel Center for Molecular Design. His industrial experience has had a major impact on his career and on his research, giving him the ability to identify challenging problems and most relevant targets. There is no way I can summarize for you his achievements, not the list of honors and awards. Every fortnight, there is a new one to add on the list. But I would like just to mention that he has offered a cat, and I will not also, I also not produce a name, a series of name in a name dropping mode of reaction that he has developed or transformation that he has achieved. It would take us a whole morning and I think during this talk it will give you a feeling for, for what it is all about. Suffice to say that developing new catalysts, he achieved that by combining metals and their environment, which we call the coordination sphere of the metal, by playing in a very subtle game between the metal and the ligands generating synergistic interaction between the ligand and the metals. And switching on the cooperativity between the ligand and the metal has allowed him to generate very powerful concepts and achieved catalytic transformation of major relevance, particularly for bonds, which are notoriously known to be very difficult to activate. His work has resulted in groundbreaking discoveries and a new concept developed and applied so successfully over years have had a huge impact. Hundreds of publications have resulted, invitation at major international conferences, a logical consequence of his recognition. There's no surprise. His achievements have been recognized worldwide by a number of achievements and awards. Just to mention Europe, he is a member of the National Academy in Germany. He received two consecutive ERC senior grants, big achievement. He received the Any Prize uh, for Protection on the Environment in 2016. This award is given by the President of the Italian Republic. He got a Senior Humboldt Award in 2010 and many other awards from various other countries. Beyond Europe, he's a member of the National Academy in the US. He has received in Israel the Gold Medal of the Chemical Society and the Israel Prize, which is the highest honor in Israel that a scientist can get. He also got elected recently to the uh, Royal Society. And, you know, as I said, I cannot just list all the awards that David has received, and he continues to be receiving. David, clearly you are an outstanding chemist and most deserving recipient of the Blaise Pascal Medal in Chemical Sciences, and we are delighted and honored to give you this medal.
I was uh, saying thank you very much, Pierre, for this very uh, kind introduction and friendship. <clears throat> Today I will tell you about some of our work in this general area. And I designed my lecture to address non-chemists as well. Just, recent, just before I saw the list of chemists standing here, so maybe uh, that wasn't necessary. But still, um, it's, necessary. it's necessary. So I apologize just at the beginning if it is overly simplified for the chemist. This is because we wanted to address a larger audience. <clears throat> so just to say one word about catalysis, I recently met, met some physicists and they didn't know what catalysis is, so I thought. So it doesn't change the thermodynamics, it just changes the barrier in going from reactants to products. And normally there are, there's a, there are a number of uh, intermediates involved in, in the process. And there could be different types of catalysis, biocatalysis, heterogeneous catalysis, and homogeneous catalysis. This is one of our, our catalysts. And it can, can be uh, visualized. So instead of climbing a mountain to achieve products, you can, if you have a tunnel going through, that makes it a lot easier. So this is the role of the catalyst, making the barrier, which is a result of bond making and breaking, much lower. So catalysis, as we already said, plays a major role. And I looked recently on the statistics, and, and you'll see 85% of all chemical products are produced using at least one catalytic step. And then also catalytic processes account for nearly 20% of the US uh, GDP. So it has a major impact on, on uh, economy and uh, <coughs> on the products that we are using. <coughs> Current directions in catalysis, <coughs> the way I, I view it, are listed here. So many of the processes, they generate waste. Nowadays, waste in the Western world is not just uh, disposed of uh, outside. There are methods to uh, um, treat them properly or uh, um, use them for other purposes. But the best is not to generate waste at all. And this is uh, our target, environmentally benign, sustainable catalytic processes, also using sustainable starting materials. Another role, very important role of, of catalysis is uh, energy-related uh, research. In this, we can see a number of areas, water splitting. This is a major direction in the world now, just generating uh, hydrogen cleanly, hopefully by using solar light. So uh, we are also involved in this area. Then if you generate hydrogen, how do you use it? So hydrogen storage comes into play, and I will tell you our research on this topic. And then advanced biofuel. Ethanol is not the best fuel, as we know. So higher alcohols, for example, they have a larger uh, energy capacity. And conversion of CO2 to fuels is also an, an active area, important area. And there is an ongoing, ongoing direction of uh, synthesis based on inert molecules, hydrocarbons, particularly selective activation of hydrocarbons, uh, activation of dinitrogen or catalytic activation that has, has drawn a lot of attention in order to uh, maybe uh, run Hubbard-type processes but under much lower energy cost. Uh, and uh, CO2 in synthesis is, is an active area. I will speak about these two, and the connection between them is that reactions that we have developed can be used both for here and for here, and I will demonstrate it in some examples. So, metalligand cooperation is our approach in this, uh, in this work. So, just a cartoon. So a metal is centered by uh, 
an environment of many ligands. Actually, most of the metal complex is, is just the ligands rather than metal itself. And, and it can, by metal ligand cooperation, split chemical bonds, putting one part of the molecule on the metal and the other one on the ligand. And this can be also going, can go this direction, making bonds. So splitting and making bonds by cooperation between the metal center and the ligand that surrounds it, or group in the ligand. A, a uh, well-known example is splitting of hydrogen or other, and other bonds between metal amido uh, type of ligands. So um, a proton goes on the nitrogen and a hydride goes on the metal and goes both ways. And Noyori used this uh, methodology quite, quite a bit, uh, and it has led in some way to his Nobel Prize when he used chiral uh, groups in the ligand. Now, we have developed, this is more for the chemist, a, a new mode of metal ligand cooperation based on what we call pincer type ligands that are not aromatic, they have been de aromatized, pyridine based ones. And they can split bonds across the metal center and the side arm. And this is, results in aromatization. And we can go also the other direction, making bonds and uh, generating this uh, de-aromatized. Now, the difference in energy between this one and this one is very small. Because here, uh, the amido bond is stronger than the dative bond on nitrogen. And here, aromatic is better than just conjugated. So it's important for catalysis to have intermediates that are not very different in energy. So we don't have deep wells that are difficult to go through. And this has led to some interesting uh, discoveries. So normally, if we want to make a bond between two molecules, we have to eliminate some, some groups. So you have here a molecule with an X activating group, another molecule with the Y activating group, and they can generate a bond uh, between the molecules, and XY is waste. That's not so good, having copious waste. And what I'm going to tell you about is um, what we call dehydrogenative coupling. So you have... Um, bond formation with elimination of hydrogen gas. And this is, involves new types of catalysts, and hydrogen itself is, is valuable. So not only you generate a, a new molecule, uh, but also generate fuel rather than generating waste. And so there's no waste. It saves energy. But you don't need to treat the waste. And it forms fuel, hydrogen. And how does this go, this dehydrogenative coupling? Again, in, in, in way of a cartoon. So you have here again this metal complex. It can cleave uh, a bond to hydrogen in a molecule, putting the hydrogen atom on the ligand and the bulk of the molecule attached to the metal center. It can cleave again another molecule and, uh, and then hydrogen elimination takes place, followed by bond formation between the two moieties, regenerating the starting catalyst. So this is a catalytic cycle, and these are intermediates in the catalytic cycle in a very simplified uh, form. And uh, we've used many metals. These are the most useful in our case. Now, which reactions are important in terms of treating, uh, in terms of uh, sustainability and environmentally benign? So this is uh, a study by pharmaceutical industry. Several major companies were involved in that. And, and they, they voted, there were six companies, they voted that amide formation avoiding poor atom economy reagents is a top priority. Amide formation is, is of course, very important. Uh, pharmaceutical industry makes peptides, makes uh, uh, intermediates that have amide bonds. 
Uh, and I think of all the processes that the pharmaceutical industry is, is using, amide bond formation is the major one. I, I uh, heard that it's around 50% of their activity. So, and, and normally it generates waste. There's protection, deprotection, and so on. So amide bond formation, avoiding poor atom economy, is a top priority. OH activation for nucleophilic substitution, so not converting the OH of alcohols to um, more reactive groups, uh, which would generate weight, but use, say, alcohols by directly. And, and I now will use uh, hemite bone formation as an example um, to what we, we've been doing. So amide bond, so you can see many compounds that they're structurally based on amide bonds. So nylon, for example, this is nylon 6, or Kevlar, this is uh, the, the type of uh, waste, waste that um, uh, policemen are using, it's bulletproof. Uh, penicillin, LSD, insulin, glutathione, hemoglobin, all proteins, of course, are based on amide, amide bonds. So you can see, for example, if you look at Kevlar, uh, here, the amide bond is, is actually nitrogen bound to carbon and a double bond to oxygen. This is the amide group. So you, you can see uh, here uh, the oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. So all, all of it is based on amide type of bonds. So what we, what we have uh, discovered already some years ago is that can, you can couple amines and alcohols uh, with elimination of two molecules of hydrogen forming an amide bond and no waste. Instead of waste, we generate hydrogen fuel. So it's one step, hydrogen gas and, and mild conditions take place here. For chemists, I, I give a little bit more detailed description. So an amine and uh, an alcohol and an amine can couple forming the amide bond with hydrogen liberation using this type of, of catalyst. It's a homogeneous type of catalyst, very effective. So th this was uh, a new reaction. Since then, uh, has been uh, used by other groups and developed, uh, and uh, other systems were also developed. So this little energy consumption, no waste, and hydrogen is evolved. The mechanism of it for, for uh, the chemist, at least the proposed mechanism, involves um, cleaving an OH bond. One proton goes to the side arm, so we have this type of uh, structure. At that time, we also proposed uh, hemilability of the amine group. Then there is what we call beta hydrogen elimination to give an, an aldehyde and a, a transdihydride uh, complex. This hydride picks up a proton from this, this part, uh, generating hydrogen and regenerating the starting compound. So this is one cycle. Then the aldehyde reacts with the amine to give a hemiaminal. This hemiaminal then adds, like the alcohol here, to this uh, de-aromatized by metal ligand cooperation followed by beta hydrogen elimination, generating this transdihydride and, and an amide. It's a clean reaction, works very well under neutral conditions. Now, at the beginning I said that you could make a connection using the same reaction between synthesis and energy. And since our reactions, many of them, generate hydrogen, so we could then think about using them for hydrogen storage. So hydrogen storage is a major challenge facing the hydrogen economy. I'll give a short introduction about that. So here is a bus. This is a bus in, in Iceland. So to teach the public, they drew the water molecule on the double doors of the bus. When you open the, the door, you cleave the water molecule. What they forgot to add is another double set of doors to make also an OO bond generate all to them. Then the hydrogen that is being produced goes into a fuel cell. 
generating electricity, uh, current, and, and water, so it's clean. So you could use, by water splitting, um, ideally solar water splitting, you can generate hydrogen cleanly and use it in, in fuel cells to generate an electric current. So everything is clean and, and uh, very nice. So for, this is the, the target, but using hydrogen directly has some issues, some very important issues that might prevent large scale use of hydrogen uh, in the hydrogen economy. First of all, there are safety issues if you have to use hydrogen under very high pressure. And now Honda, for example, has a car on, on a testing basis that has a cylinder 700 atmospheres of hydrogen. So they, they say it's, it's, it's safe, and I'm sure they're right, but I wouldn't want to try it anyway in case of, of accident, uh, God forbid. Now, but the major issue for using hydrogen directly is uh, that it has low volumetric energy density. So at 700 atmospheres, it has 4.4 megajoule per liter, and as a, as a liquid, hydrogen liquid, has uh, double as much, while gasoline has much more, 31.6 megajoule per liter. So the volumetric energy content of hydrogen is quite low. And then uh, you have to bring in into uh, the vehicle, by the way, it's not only vehicle, it could be also residential areas, it could also be modes of transfer of hydrogen. Uh, you have to take into consideration the additional equipment you bring in, so the weight of storage containers, and then the energy that you spend in liquefying hydrogen or putting it under high pressure has to be taken into consideration. These are major uh, obstacles, and as a result, um, several directions for developing hydrogen storage, in other words, um, having the hydrogen in other forms um, were pursued, and uh, some of them are listed here, mostly based on, on solid type of uh, approaches. All of them are, have challenging issues involved. In our case, uh, as well as in several other groups' uh, approach, we, we, use we use the approach of liquid organic hydrogen carriers. And what is this? What is this concept? So it's very simple. So taking an organic liquid by uh, influence of catalyst, liberating hydrogen from this organic liquid and generating a hydrogen lean product. And then take this hydrogen lean, treat it with hydrogen, hopefully under mild conditions, and make the organic, uh, uh, regenerate the hydrogen-rich organic uh, liquid. Um, ideally, it will be the same catalyst for both processes, so you, can, you don't need to remove the hydrogen-depleted organic compound. It can be, if it's very mild use of hydrogen, regenerated in situ. You, you, uh, you, if it's the same type of catalyst rather than using uh, additional catalyst. So the uh, Department of Energy of the US has a target for next year. And this is 5.5 weight percent. In other words, the amount, the weight of hydrogen that you generate should be 5.5 uh, weight percent of the uh, uh, organic hydrogen carrier or other hydrogen carrier, including also the additional weight that you use, like cylinders or um, con other containers. So it's not a simple target. And here I can show you one example which uses formic acid as a uh, hydrogen carrier. Now, you could see hydrogen is evolved. There is a uh, fuel cell, and, and the fuel cell generates electricity that drives the car. This is with formic acid, but this is not, doesn't conform 
exactly to the concept of liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Because it generates CO2, and then you have to uh, collect and, and, and reverse the process. Also, formic acid is corrosive. And in addition, and that's the major point, uh, the uh, weight percent of hydrogen here is, is about 4%. So it's significantly lower than, than the target. So the requirements for liquid organic hydrogen carriers is you, you want high hydrogen capacity by weight, uh, easily stored under ambient conditions. Uh, hydrogen can be generated relatively easily by use of a catalyst, and the spent compound can be easily, readily hydrogenated, ideally in the same location. So, and ideally it should be compatible with existing infrastructure like in gas stations. So you add this compound, instead of using uh, the gasoline. So just historically, uh, one of the well-known compounds is this n ethyl carbazole, uh, which uh, can liberate, uh, per hydro n ethyl carbazole, which can liberate hydrogen generating this n ethyl carbazole. But it's, it's a uh, thermodynamically unfavorable reaction, uh, requires really high, high temperature, and uh, like 230 degrees, and under those conditions, some of the N-ethyl group cleaves, so the, the compound is decomposed with time. And then uh, hydrogenation works well, still requiring relatively high pressure, but manageable. And they were, th this was developed by Air Products in collaboration with BMW, United Technologies, and the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And uh, there was an announcement that this breakthrough, breakthrough for hydrogen fuel storage is like a liquid battery. Liquid battery, because it generates electricity in combination with a fuel cell. So, but that was pretty much abandoned. There was a lot of uh, research on that uh, because of the uh, relative instability at the high, high temperature. A state-of-the-art system, I think probably one of the best systems currently, is this uh, dibenzyl, tolu dibenzyl toluene based process, so the perhydro. Again, in high temperatures, higher than 250, it's normally around 300 degrees, can liberate hydrogen. And this is again an endothermal process. Ideally, we want this process to be the simpler one. Uh, and, and it can then be um, hydrogenated back to the perhydro compounds. It's uh, attractive because the theoretical hydrogen capacity here is 6.2 weight percent already. If we talk just about the organic compound, it already exceeds the DOE target. But at quite high temperature, the composition of the benzyl bond start to take place. So that's again, you, you, you don't you want to have this compound as part of the investment that you have rather than, uh, regen uh, uh, rather than uh, having it partially decomposed and requiring uh, replenishing it. So how do we come in into this story? Uh, so we, we have discovered the amide bond formation by coupling of alcohols and amines to give peptides. So if you take now a molecule that is both an amine and an alcohol, it will couple with itself to give this cyclic dipeptide. And with this catalyst, uh, uh, it can generate four equivalents of, of hydrogen. And, uh, and, and a significant point is that in this case, this is uh, thermodynamically favorable. The reaction is exergonic, unlike all the other systems that I described and beyond that. So, and the di, this uh, cyclic dipeptide can be hydrogenated back to the ethanolamine. An advantage is that it has, it exceeds the DOE target. Uh, it's an inexpensive hydrogen carrier. Ethanolamine is, is produced in huge amounts because it's a scavenger for CO2 for coal with coal-fired power plants. 
And same catalyst for both directions, and the conditions are relatively mild, and it's compatible with the existing infrastructure. Ideally, if we talk about transportation, a car will come in and you uh, load its tank with ethanolamine. And uh, there are deficiencies. Uh, we need to reduce uh, catalyst loading, uh, which is, we can get 10,000 turnovers, but it's not enough. And enhance catalyst long-term stability, enhance selectivity. We get some linear uh, products. It's not a major problem because we can reverse it, the whole mixture. And uh, uh, extension to, we have to extend to other carriers the same type of concept. Very recently, we've also developed uh, another reaction based on uh, ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol is the antifreeze that we're using it in any car anyway. So with the catalyst, this is the type of catalyst, it can co be converted to oligoesters with generation of significant amount of uh, uh, hydrogen. And the amount of hydrogen is, uh, depends on uh, the degree of polymerization. So if we reach uh, 10, 10 molecules coupling, so we, we can get it almost to 6.5 weight percent of hydrogen, which is quite good. Uh, so in summary of that, what I've just described, so we've developed reactions for green synthesis. Amide bond formation is, is just uh, one uh, of the reactions. We developed many others. Uh, and the same reaction is good also for sustainable energy, except hydrogen storage, for example. So we, we make waste-free synthetic processes and new hydrogen storage system. And uh, just for, for uh, a broader picture, so we can take alcohols, convert them to ester with hydrogen liberation. We can make polyesters and hydrogen storage based on that. Uh, with with uh, amine, one can get amide and hydrogen storage, I just mentioned. Other catalysts give imines, and that can be used to make pyrazines, pyrroles, pyridines, quinolines. Uh, with, with ammonia, uh, we can also reverse uh, uh, the reaction, actually. Well, with ammonia, we can couple alcohols to give amines and water, but we can also reverse it to go back to uh, the alcohol. Uh, using just water, we can oxidize uh, alcohols to carboxylic acid salts and using water in a base and, what, and uh, generating hydrogen. We can also couple uh, alcohols for, to sulfons to make carbon-carbon um, bonds from alcohols. We can hydrogenate carbamic acid derivatives, hydrogenate even urea, which is the most resistive com uh, complex for hydrogenation among the carbonyl compounds. And uh, we, we can uh, convert capture compounds, uh, capture CO2 to methanol. A, a new direction is that we can take cyclic amines, just water, no base, no, no, uh, nothing else except the catalyst, and convert the CH2 group to a carbonyl group with hydrogen generation. And with template catalysis, it's a new approach to make um, CC bonds under base-free room temperature reaction, like addition to Michael acceptors with no base room temperature. So, uh, and we can use many base metals. We don't need uh, only uh, precious metals. These are people that, over the years, my group is much smaller, were involved, and I thank these uh, agencies for financial support. Uh, particularly, the ERC was very kind to us. And here we can see a recent picture from our group. We don't normally wear ties in the labs, but uh, there was a farewell party for one of the people, so people said we, we have to be distinguished to, uh, for this special occasion. And thank you very much for your attention. challenges. Of course, without emphasizing 
the fundamental research that is needed to understand all these catalysts. This is the groundwork which has been very, very instrumental in the development of social science. I'm looking whether we have time for questions or not. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we have time for taking a picture because the photograph of it comes. That doesn't answer the question. Do we have time for questions or not? Yes. Yes, okay. Well, one question. So think about a question. This was a quicker one. Any chance for efficient photosynthesis? Yeah. Any chance for efficient photosynthesis? Well, many groups are, of course, going uh, that direction. Uh, you ask ba basically modifying the photosynthesis in the sense of generating hydrogen rather than carbohydrates, right? And uh, I think with time it will be developed. So uh, uh, I'm not sure our group, but uh, it will be developed with time. So. Thank you.